Hello, everyone. Welcome to Mind Pump. In the first half of this episode, we talk about quality of life versus longevity and how having a pizza and beer every once in a while may actually help you live longer. Also, we talk about fatherhood and its effect on your brain as well as other topics. In the second half of the show, we answer four questions from our Mind Pump Media Instagram account. Questions such as, how do I determine my ideal weight? Is going to failure every set better for hypertrophy? Are supersets necessary if time is not an issue? And if you choose your sponsors because you think they're the best, why have you stopped working with some of them? Finally, if you're enjoying Mind Pump and you'd like to help us grow, there's no better way to do it than by sharing our other channel, Mind Pump Clips. Go over there, subscribe, and share. All right, enjoy the show. When you're looking at your fitness routine and your diet, there's a couple things you want to consider. One is longevity. Will this help me live longer? But also balance it out with quality of life. Am I also enjoying my life more today and now? So the reason why I'm bringing this up is because... Uh, yeah, explain that. That can be a little confusing because quality of life versus longevity seem like they would be kind of the same, one and the same. Yes. Yeah, so here's a great example, right? Um, I'm going out. I'm going to go out with you guys. We haven't gone out in a little while. So we're hanging out. We're having a good time. And we're drinking, uh, you know, alcohol. We're enjoying ourselves with some drinks. What's this is probably my fault. What's yeah. Justin wearing? Yeah. <laughs> what am I wearing? Oh, you want to paint the picture? Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's paint the whole picture here. <laughs> Not a lot. If uh, really short shorts. <laughs> so <laughs> sorry, I ruined your, <laughs> did I ruin it for you? So anyway, no, but, but like we're going out, and we're hanging out, I haven't hung out with you guys in a while, and, and we're getting drinking margaritas, and we're we're getting drinks, and we're getting a little tipsy. I'm definitely not contributing to my longevity, right? I'm definitely not contributing to. Uh, my quote unquote, like physiological health in that, in the, I guess the conventional uh, standings or, or setting, but I am improving my quality of life. I'm enjoying my life. I'm enjoying the time that I'm spending with you. And this is an important thing to balance. So fitness fanatics sometimes mess up mm. because they sacrifice like quality and enjoyment for this, like either performance or they sacrifice, uh, you know, for longevity's sake, they sacrifice, uh, you know, enjoying themselves with friends, families, birthday parties, that kind of stuff. And then on the flip side, you can also be at a balance where it's all about right now. It's all about eating food that I enjoy right this second. It's all about relaxing right now, but they're sacrificing the future and the longevity. So it is this, this balance uh, that you have to look at. And this is why you'll hear us talking about enjoying ourselves and having fun and, you know, we'll smoke the occasional joint or we'll have, you know, the occasional drink. That's we're definitely not thinking about like longevity uh, when we're doing that. We're not thinking of 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 health in the physiological sense. We're thinking more of like, well, this is quality of life. I'm connecting with people and I'm enjoying myself, yeah, and not, it's this balance. Well, two biohacking. Two thoughts on that. One, uh, that's de there's a very fine line there. I feel like it's a balance. Um, and then two, I actually think you can make the argument that when you are making that decision for you know, quote unquote, quality of life. It is also longevity though. I mean, when you share the research around um, the importance of relationships in relation to longevity, um, the it plays a bigger factor than many of the things that we do to pursue to pursue longevity. In, in, I'm in, so glad you said that. So- 100%. So there's actually uh, a part of that where- it may not feel like you are pursuing longevity by making a decision to drink with your friends that night. But if it enhances your relationships with other people, friends, family, uh, and, and acquaintances like that, then there are, there are value or values to that, that are attached to longevity. Um, I, you, yeah. I'm so glad you went there because that's very true. Um, there are things that we do in the moment to enjoy ourselves um, that also, I believe, and the data, like you said, Adam, will support, will also contribute to longevity. For example, you have some studies that'll show that one glass of wine a day uh, contributes to longevity. Now, these are poorly done studies because the controls aren't phenomenal. And what I think that's happening is people who have like one drink a night, not 10 or five or just one drink, they're probably doing it with people around them and bonding with them. So what's contributing to longevity? Is it the wine or is it yeah. the the socialization and the connecting uh, with the people around I, them? Yeah, I think a lot of that is misleading because you'll get a lot of um, certain things like that will come up, resveratrol or things yeah. that like they'll try and kind of pin it to 
uh, like one specific thing, but I think it's just really just the flexibility and like taking a, a little bit of the air out of the intensity of always having to be super rigid about, well, this is like the most healthy option for me always. And I have to stay in that lane uh, to be able to, you know, drag this out for, uh, you know, more years. It's going to add more years to my life versus like really the social component, the flexibility of the um, the ability to kind of, uh, you know, navigate through and do things that you enjoy and, uh, with everybody else. Yeah, it's true for workouts too. Like there's definitely, I, I could construct a very balanced, ideal, perfect, like this is the, what your workout program should look like long-term for longevity, mobility, flexibility, strength, the whole deal. But like, what if you're like super, like, you know, yeah, that's cool. And I'll do some of that because I love bodybuilding. Or I love powerlifting. Like that's my like real passion with fitness. And it may be a little extreme. And yes, I could be devoting more time to these other fitness pursuits in the pursuit of longevity. But man, I love like lifting heavy or I love, you know, training in these extreme ways sometimes. Uh, I, it, also, I also think that that's not just okay. I think that's probably the way you should do it because you want to find that, that enjoyment. I was actually talking to somebody uh, at the live event um, that we just had, and, and we were talking about that in terms of like just looking at it more as a cyclical thing. Like it's it's a big pie that like inevitably there's going to be a part of the pie that's like you're going to be neglecting. And, you know, to be able to constantly kind of address and see where those deficits lie and just adjust and kind of do them sequentially in season. Like I'm going to focus on this, but then I know this is probably going to drop off and then I'm going to come back and revisit it and just keep kind of like keep keep that accountability of I've been focused a lot on performance right now. And therefore I have to come back and maybe like uh, address some of my joint health and kind of slow down a bit and, you know, add more lifestyle uh, focus. So it's just like something that life is, is dynamic. It's not like this linear thing that like, yeah. it's always just going to work out like, you know, in, in a straight line. Now, how much self-awareness do you think is required for this though? I feel like oh, man. Uh, you quickly can start smelling your own farts and thinking that they smell great. Uh, oh, this is this is for my longevity. This is better for me. Like, and then you start justifying uh, these behaviors, and then it becomes the opposite of uh, your pursuit of longevity. So, so how much self awareness is required for someone to mm. to be able to do constant. this? You need good friends. You too. need yeah, and you need constant. You need a constant practice where to you check examine in yourself. Yeah, where you examine yeah. self awareness. So, mm -hmm. for someone that might look like. Uh, prayer or it might look like uh, meditation where you kind of take this big view of everything and you look at everything and go, you know, is that really like, I know that, you know, drinking can, can sometimes improve my quality of life, but am I really drinking to improve my quality of life or is sometimes it to avoid life, for example, right. Or to distract myself. Um, yeah, I know I like to train a particular way, but am I really going too far and is it causing problems for me? Am I being honest with myself, you know, that, that type of stuff. So I think that's a big part of it because otherwise you're right. You'll get law. I mean, we all do. I've gotten lost in the, you know, you, Oh yeah, this is great. Oh yeah. And then eventually yeah, I'm killing it. Yeah. The signals get so loud. You can't ignore it. And you go, yeah, well, I, I wasn't, I wasn't being very honest with myself. I wasn't really examining it uh, from that standpoint. So I think that's a constant thing. I really yeah. Do. I feel like we've seen a lot of that um, in, in particular, the, the cannabis space, right? Because the pendulum has swung so far in the opposite, like just, 10, 15 years ago, it was so taboo and it was still considered bad and like definitely nobody in the health and fitness. And, then it, and then, it, then it cured everything. Yeah. Now it cures <laughs> everything. It's so amazing. Really receptors like, all over our body. And, and I mean, <laughs> and, I, and I'm guilty of this, right? I'm, I'm just as guilty of, uh, you know, attaching all the, the things that when I think about it, all the positive things about yeah. it, when I also recognize that it has a dark side to it, it has, uh, it, it can still, even though it doesn't have addictive properties in it, it still can become an addictive behavior, especially when you start to rationalize how good it is for you. And I feel like I've seen that more in the last three to five years than I ever have. And in including myself where I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, it's good for me. All these health benefits. Yeah. And it's just like, okay, when you start doing that um, and, and justifying some of these behaviors that are probably not benefiting you. Well, okay. So let me ask you, because anything can be bad, I guess, quote unquote, bad for you if it becomes, if you develop a bad relationship with it, or if you start to develop addictive, um, I guess an addictive relationship to it, anything, right? Exercise, 
can do that. Pornography, uh, television, anything, food. Anything, yeah. yeah anything. I mean, even, even a friend, you could get, you could develop a bad relationship, a codependent yeah, absolutely. relationship. So what does that look like for you when you're looking at something like that? When do you say to yourself like, okay, uh, I need to back off. Are there signs that you look for or things that you. Yeah. I think the, when I consistently am doing something like that, that I know is not uh, ideal and healthy. For like when me. it just becomes too often, too frequent. Yeah. yeah. When, when, the, when the frequency of it uh, and, and when I catch myself justifying it, like you, when I catch myself going like, Oh yeah. Or I'll say something to someone else. I'm like, Oh, I, I can see I'm, I'm selling myself my own bullshit, yeah. you know, and I, and I'm aware, I, I'm aware of it when we're I the do. best, we're the biggest buyers <laughs> yeah. of our own bullshit. Yeah, right? no, 100%. <laughs> and, and I, and I tell you what, and you've brought this up before that this podcast has been one of the, the coolest, uh, you know, uh, tools of reflection because, you know, I, I'll, one, I'll either hear myself say it later on in an edit or something, or someone else will say, oh, you said this, or Katrina will say like, hey, I didn't know you felt that way about, and then I'll be like, I don't know, do I really, you know, or yeah. I did say that, didn't I? Like, do I believe that? Like, so, uh, do you yeah. Know how many times that's happened to me where I'll listen to one of our episodes and I'll hear myself and be like, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I was, I was, it's actually one of my favorite parts. It come out quite how I was trying to articulate. Yeah. Or just like, uh, that sounds like I was selling myself on yeah. some shit. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's one of my favorite parts, uh, that about this business that I didn't go into it thinking like, I didn't think it was like, Hey, I want to get into podcasting with you guys. So it would be an awesome growth vehicle. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that was not what I, I did for I, the therapy. Yeah, no, I wasn't, I, I didn't think of that at all, but it, it's naturally happened because you do, you it's it, we, we record something and we put it out there. It's forever out there. And so it really makes you start to evaluate like uh, what you say and do you really, and your beliefs. Wow, you, you know? imagine, what if couples, this would never happen, but what if couples like right when they're about to argue, they hit record on something? <laughs> that way they could play it later. Well, you remember that, uh, wasn't that uh, a Black revealing. Mirror episode yes. where you could go back and yeah. replay? Oh my God. Uh, yeah. yeah. That I wonder, would freak me out because it's like, that's feasible. It seems it, like, like yeah. they, I feel, I feel like they really could do something like that. It very, it just, yeah. Like imagine that, like you, you could just go back and like I actually zoom think, in. I actually think we're going to see it. I mean, I mean, you see uh, you know, examples of that in sports with what, how far the replay has come and everything like that. that you Talk can, about an ego check. That's not what I said. That's not what <laughs> yeah. I said. Oh yeah. <laughs> replay the tape. <laughs> oh yeah. Has that ever happened to you? That's, so text will do that sometimes where I, like I'll, I'll, you know, be talking to Jessica and she'll be like, well, you said this. I'm like, no, I didn't. She says, yeah, you did. And then I'll scroll up and be like, oh, shit. Mm -hmm. I totally, like, I'm not even pretending to think that I didn't. I literally believed that I didn't say it that way. Yeah. yeah. Pretty wild. That'll yeah. be a, that'll be a super ego <laughs> check if that Buster. happens. What's up, everybody? Here's the giveaway for today's episode. It's the at-home holiday bundle. That's the sale this month, by the way. Here's what it is. Maps Anywhere, Maps Suspension, Maps Prime, and the No BS six-pack formula. So... If you leave a comment in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode, subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. And if we pick your comment, you'll win the at-home holiday bundle. Now, everybody else, those programs would retail combined for $338. But right now, if you go to, if you click on the link at the top of the description below, the price is $99.99. Again, $99.99. You get Maps Anywhere, Maps Suspension, Maps Prime, and the No BS six-pack formula. Once again, if you want that, Click on the link at the top of the description below to get yourself set up. All right, here comes the show. What yeah. did you uh, What did you guys think? I mean, it's crazy. We we really haven't been together. Um, that was such a unique uh, last two weeks for us, right? We had a, a week around Thanksgiving, and then we had yeah. the well. You know what? Let me your, your let, let me get in there because um, we so we recorded ahead of time with podcasts so that we could air them because we were preparing for your baby, the baby. Yeah. And, uh, I haven't announced it on the podcast, but no, ba baby, baby Dahlia, uh, Dahlia Magdalena was born. She was born on the 20th of November, which was perfect timing. So isn't that wonderful? Baby was born right when it would have been perfect for us to take yep. time off. Um, and it was, uh, dude, I'll tell you this birth was the, such a different experience from the last one. Really? Awesome. It's, oh, bro. It's like- On the positive side, I imagine. Night, so we experienced with Aurelius the, what they call the, uh, the sequence of intervention or the cascading interventions that happen when you go to give birth in a traditional hospital. And so the-, the, the like Everything feels like a crisis. Well, what happens is you, you, you show up and of course they prod you, poke you, test this, test that. That tends to cause either conscious or subconscious anxiety in the mother. 
because uh, it feels like an emergency situation, right? Everybody's rushing, freaking out a little bit. That can cause the labor to slow down or stop or things to tighten up. And then, of course, you're not progressing enough or fast enough. So the next, the first intervention tends to be Pitocin. Yep. Pitocin causes contractions that are far more intense and without the natural breaks that tend to happen between contractions naturally. So you get these hard contractions. They're really, really intense. They, be, they come one after another because they're artificially happening. And then you can't tolerate the pain because it's just relentless. You get an epidural. Now you have an epidural, you're disconnected from half your body, which then makes, you know, pushing a baby out or making that process happen more challenging. You can't get up and move, right? Because you're, you're stuck. You can't which, move Which, your by the way, I would actually, to, I would add to that, that that's already an area that is challenging uh, for a woman to connect to, like muscle, muscular, yeah. muscle wise, yeah. right? Like, it's like uh, teaching someone to draw on their core for the very first time. And, they, and they're like, what do you mean by that? You have to push and relax right. at the same time. Right, right. And so you're, you're asking someone to do something that is, 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 is typically very difficult for the average person. And then you, put, you numb them. Like that, I've always thought that was really crazy, like the, that we expect uh, a woman to be able to control those muscles while also being numbed in right. that area. And, it's crazy. And because the environment in a hospital, now hospitals are phenomenal at treating emergencies. Um, and so, and, and, and pregnant women going in for birth, it, it definitely gives you that vibe. Like this is an emergency. And so then you get the epidural and then you're not, it's not happening or whatever, for whatever reason, uh Oh, baby's heart rate starting to slow down C-section. So the C-section rate in some hospitals is almost 50%, which is insane. Absolutely mm. insane. That makes no sense evolutionarily speaking. So anyway, we, we experienced that with Aurelius partially because we had scheduled, uh, a birth with midwives, um, which midwives are, they are experts in natural delivery. That's they're the, they're, if anybody in the world understands natural childbirth, it's a midwife. That's what they do. OBs deliver babies, but they're surgeons. That's what their, their training is in. So, uh, we had it scheduled, but because it went past two weeks past due, the law says, you are not, midwives are not allowed to deliver your baby. You have to go to the hospital. So our options were stay at home and just do this on our own, which we're going to do or go to the hospital. So that's why this all happened. So then she had the C-section and then through that process, the rate that it, there's a, a, a lower rate of successful latching for the baby, the breast milk doesn't come as fast. So it's just much more challenging thing. Plus you had a major surgery and the whole deal, right? Well, with Dahlia, luckily, you know, we scheduled it in a birth center with the midwives and the experience was so crazy different. It was remarkably different. Like we, she's going through some of the early labor at home and we, we have a doula, we call the doula and the doula is, we have this, uh, this app that tracks the contractions. I know you guys use it too, right? Mm -hmm. Where you're looking at the mm -hmm. contractions and the doula's like, oh, you, you guys are moving quick, get to the birth center. We get there, doula meets us there. We're waiting for the midwife. And so Jessica's laboring in the parking lot and just the, the, the way that the doula and the midwives, first off, I've never been in such uh, feminine wisdom energy in my entire life. I literally was in awe the entire time. The, the calmness and the, the energy and the, just the wisdom that these women had, like I felt zero anxiety. I felt like I was in the hands of, uh, of just these, these goddesses that knew exactly. What, so we had two midwives there, the doula. We're laboring in the birth center. So we have the tub and the bed and the whole deal. And the contractions were different than when she had Pitocin. So it's almost like her body, when she would get too exhausted, the gaps between the contractions would, would lengthen a little mm -hmm. bit. And there was a period there before we were at the end where her body almost gave her a break for mm -hmm. like 20 minutes. And they told us, oh yeah, this is going to happen. This happens. Your body's giving you a break because we're going to start pushing. We're almost, you know, there or whatever. And then, you know, we had the baby and it was the most remarkable insane, crazy. Like I'm not, you guys know, I'm not like a big, like I don't cry a ton or whatever. I lost it, man. Baby came out and I was just, it was absolutely incredible. It was the most amazing experience of my entire life. Oh, wow. And then, you know, four or five hours later, we go home. We don't spend the night there. Yeah. We go home because the first, uh, deep sleep, they said, <clears throat> it's really important. You go home. The baby needs to sleep real deep. Oh, wow. So we drove home and then it's just so just different. Night and day different. So, <laughs> so, di I mean, us. she's healed better. The, the, the latching happened faster. Everything happened faster. It was just, uh, or, or better. It was remarkable. That's so, that's so Pretty awesome. incredible experience. You, you cried. 
I cried. Did you cry over the holidays? Cry? No. Yeah. Why'd you cry over the holidays? I I, I cried at my Thanksgiving speech. I did oh, not, that's right. I, yeah, I didn't I didn't see that coming either. I um, you know, we have this tradition where we uh, right right before we eat, we say a prayer, and then everybody goes around the table and says something they're thankful yeah. for. And we were up at the Truckee House, and uh, and I I I totally knew what I was going to say because it was on my mind during that week that I was with family. But I, I didn't realize how heavy it was until I said it. And then I started, I couldn't get through. I was like crying so bad, grabbed my brother and everybody started, the whole table started crying. Um, and what it was, I, th- I kind of chuckle when I think back, like what it was, because someone else would be like, that's kind of funny that you would cry over that. But um, I felt uh, so much love for, because uh, we were with Katrina's family, mostly Katrina's family, had some of mine, but mostly her family was there. And uh, we've had the opportunity to experience that house now for, I think, three or four years. Are we going on the fourth year, Doug? Four years it will be the next 2019. year. 2019. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's th- three years. Three years going on four that we've had had this place and have had the opportunity to experience it with a lot of family, a lot of friends. Most all of my family and friends have now been up there at least once or twice. And every time I have lots of people there, uh, it's not very relaxing for me. I find myself- Because like you're hosting? Yeah, one, because I'm hosting, two, because the place is so nice uh, and I want it taken care of. And so I find in a lot of people in one place, it's, it's you know, so I'm running behind everybody. I have a lot of pride, in, as you guys do, in that place. And uh, her her family is just the, the best when it comes to, especially her brother, uh, Andy, who you guys know pretty well. Mm-hmm. Like every time I would come out of my room with that, like he would, I'd see him with the, the broom sweeping the floors or doing the dishes or changing light bulbs for us oh, or nice. fixing sinks. If there was any sort of drip or li- I mean, and it gave me this like sense of, Oh, like I could just be there for the whole week, be with the family, not be thinking about the house the whole time. And like, I didn't realize how much emotion was built up from that when, until I started saying thank you to everybody. Then, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> started crying. Then everybody else started crying. I was like, Oh my God, I didn't know it was, I knew it was a big deal. I didn't know it was that big of a deal for me that <laughs> I didn't get to realize, me. but I mean, do you guys feel that way? <laughs> yeah. You see me. I mean, you guys go up there with family and stuff like that. How do you guys feel? I mean, that's how it is oh. for me. Very Fortunately, similar. with my family, everybody's very respectful of the house. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they all have nice houses, and so they're used to it. But um, yeah, so I've I've never really had a lot of people come up. You know, usually it's just me and the girlfriend, or yeah. you know, just uh, a couple other people, Your brother or whatever. And everybody's been really good. Yeah, but uh, not everybody does share that same respect for the mm-hmm. house. Um, I mean, I I you know I've taken off my shoes at my own house for boy, 25 years. Yeah, me too. And we do that up there. And a lot of people have a real problem with that. It's like, why yeah. you make us take our shoes off? And it's like, well, could you be walking is... outside and stepping in dog crap and, and all that? Well, especially why you there because you house? got mud and rain and snow. Yeah. And so you you don't just track in a little bit. You track in like all kinds of mud. Yeah, it's and always shit. funny to me that there's resistance with that with some people. Yeah, my it's ironically though, it's funny. My, uh, my wife's family is like, way better at that stuff too. Like they're very, very like attention to detail, like helpful, like very respectful of the place more so than even my own family. So it's, it's interesting. And I do definitely appreciate and notice it. It's just like one of those things you just see, you know, how people kind of like carry themselves and like help out. And they're just like doing things. I always it makes you feel way better. I always thought it was weird when like, if I go to someone's house, I don't, I don't care whose house it is and we eat or whatever. I always try to offer to clean up. And help, you know, wash the dishes or whatever. I was kind of raised that way. I was going to say, that's part of your culture. It is, but it's weird when you have people over and they don't do that kind of stuff and they just sit there and okay, whatever, but it kind of feels weird. Yeah. Like, hey, don't you, you know, I don't know. It feels nice. It's And I'll tell people to sit down, by the way. I don't expect you to help, but I do like the offer for you to get up and, and, you know. Yeah, it makes a world of a difference for me. I mean, it it was the first time that I had spent a week up there that I felt like I really got to just relax and enjoy the place. Many, a lot of times we'll go on like a trip like that. And then afterwards I'll take a trip and like, I want to go up there by ourselves next week, week, next time. Like I want to go right back so I can actually relax. Yeah, so I can relax and actually feel like I enjoy the place because I felt like the whole time I was like serving everybody, which I I don't mind that too. Like, right, I like, I like to share my things with people and I like to show people a good time. So by no means am I complaining, but I realized that I do that a lot and I didn't realize how much it was so nice to like, just relax like that. And you, it all came out when I, when I said thank you to my, my brother and my That's family so nice. and stuff like that. Yeah. So I think for, for me, the big thing besides the baby being born, which obviously was remarkable was watching my wife be a f- 
just a warrior. And then as a man, I can't do anything <laughs> like to take oh, it away yeah. other than hug her right. and hold her the whole time. And so watching her do this, like, and just be just a, just a champion, just bearing the entire burden of this process and being so, uh, I don't know, in awe. I remember you saying that too. I, yeah, when you you know, that's, so we, I talked about this at the live event with some people that asked about. Like just know. admiring her strength and what I, she did. It's like, uh, uh, wow. I didn't have the, mm -hmm. um, I didn't have the typical first time father response that I, I heard from so many people, like so many dads I know, um, didn't feel connected to the baby very much until the the actual birth happened. And then, I mean, I, I've heard the story from my mom, my father cried. Like she'd never seen my father cry. He cried when I was born. Mm. Like I hear that story a lot. Like it hits men. Like when the baby gets there, then it's like, boom, this yeah. overwhelming. I didn't have that uh, so much for Max uh, like that. I, I, the thing that rocked my world was my connection with Katrina. Yeah. I, that was, and it was exactly what you just said was, watching her you know champion that whole process and like just it was like it was like watching her in like the most brutal fight mm -hmm. and her like wanting to give up but then still getting back up yeah like, and and then like and you have and i can't do anything Bro. but be there and like cheer her on and being like oh my god i would quit if i was she there. was so exhausted yeah. in between contractions she'd p pass out like fall asleep, like she was oh out. God. And then another one would hit and wake her up. And I'm watching her do this. So I'm like, oh my God, yeah. you're a beast. Yeah, yeah, I saw a fear in Katrina's eyes that I had never, I, in 12 years, I'd never seen. And that like just fucking blah, melted me. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> like yeah. quit. Just quit. We don't have to do it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, yeah. go ahead, quit. You know? Well, so I, one thing I did, right, is I filmed from start to finish. I did a bunch of filming. Now, I, I want to be clear. I'm not an asshole who gets the phone to film all the time. She was very explicit with me beforehand. You need to film everything. So oh, I got all these videos of her, you know, like, you know, going, you know. Now, have you guys watched it? Oh, yeah, we've watched all. But it's funny because I, I show people that and I'm like, I wonder if they think I'm like, you know, while my wife's like, like a social I'm like, you're like a social media guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like, oh my God, this guy's so narcissistic. Did he put his phone? No, down? she like told a me. Drone in there. No, she she literally packed tripods. No, we want a phone up here. I want a phone up here. Recording. I want to wow. do this and that. And so I'm like, all right, you We're want capturing this? this. Yeah, we'll bring this steady cam. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. pretty fun. I mean, there's part of me that probably wishes that I have a, had a clip of of that moment. I mean, it's forever ingrained in me that yeah. I feel like I can replay it in my own head, but it would probably have been neat to see. It is cool. We have them saved now. So, I mean, I, I like hearing the story from her, her mom and her sister were the only two people that were in the room. And they, so hearing them tell the story of us at like that time. So I have like, I feel Dude, like I had a moment with, uh, with my, cause I had, we had Dahlia, we came home and then, you know, we have Aurelius and my elder, my older kids. There was a moment where I was on the couch and I was holding Dahlia, Aurelius was next to me, my other son's next to me, my other daughter's next. There's all of my kids, like four of them, sitting with me on the couch. Just a big full family. Are you kidding? Dude, I felt like uh, like my chest was going to explode. Like there was too much inside. I was like, oh, it's the greatest <laughs> feeling of all time. That's great, man. Yeah. Well, how, speak, how is sleep going though right now? Are, are you, way, uh, I mean, it better this time? It's challenging, but it's way better oh, than good. it was with, uh, with Aurelius. Oh, so, good. but she's still, you know, obviously, of course, you have a baby. It's going to be, especially if you breastfeed. It's going to be, you know, there's going to be some sleep deprivation involved. Now, speaking of uh, men crying, uh, James Cameron, did you guys see his tweet? Oh, my God. Wow. I, I've never wanted to slap this guy. Something, something related now. to testosterone. Doug, I don't know if you could pull it up. It's literally the most ridiculous, embarrassing, inaccurate. I thing am embarrassed. I've ever Very embarrassed for him. It's so stupid. And for people who deny that there's this kind of like mainstream media war on men, no, there's not. There is 100%. A war on men, and it's constant. And, it, can, and he's he's an example of him talking about how testosterone is toxic. Yeah. Well, can we read the actual quote? Because I mean, it's it's it was something about like trying to get it out of your system completely. Like uh, like men need to work it out because it's a toxin. Yeah. Uh, you what? know, testosterone. What you got for us, Doug? Yeah, I'm trying to open it. It says Avatar director James Cameron says testosterone is a toxin men must terminate from their system. What? Okay, first like, of all, what is he trying to do? Like, first I of all, understand. if you if you if obviously uh, testosterone in the context of conversation is is proxy for male men, right? So if I say estrogen, estrogen should be should be eliminated. I'm talking about women. So he's talking about men. Uh, number one. Number two. This is it's physiologically inaccurate because 
Yeah. No men with low testosterone are more aggressive, more irritable, yeah. less innovative, Very unhealthy. worse fathers, worse husbands. They're sick. They die earlier. So it's, you're just totally unhealthy. It's and it's it's inaccurate that testosterone is toxic. It's not a talk. It's a hormone, and we have a balance of hormones. And a man with healthy testosterone. Okay, I don't know if I. I don't healthy. know if I buy it. I don't, I'm like I have such a hard time right now with the amount of of bullshit that that we see on on social media and how much stuff is uh, fabricated in order to get attention that you know like the the liver king right we talked a little bit about that with um with max when max was here and i, I mean i 100 percent believe he had the foresight on all of this i you have to know that eventually you're running around with your shirt off and you're jacked on you know fifteen thousand dollars worth of hormones that sooner or later it was going to come out. And I don't think he fucking cared. I think mm. he knew that he was going to get enough attention. The same thing goes for something like this. Sometimes I think like James Cameron has the avatars coming out again, right? It hopefully is another massive blockbuster you know, he's hoping for. And uh, what a great way to stir up conversation about him than to put some bullshit post or tweet like this out to get people no way. talking and arguing I, here, about Here's it. why I disagree with that. That is going to, it's going to get him less sales. Okay, Watch. so most people would say that about Liver King. Most people would say to him lying. Totally like different lied. market. Mm -hmm. That's a totally different market. I, I look. You know how many same game though. Different market. Same I don't game. know. You know how many movies have lost because of the, because the producer or the director or the actors make it like this like weird political thing. I mean, and listen, they lose right. ticket sales. I'm, I'm not necessarily saying that for sure. It, it's that scenario, but boy, am I so skeptical yeah, now I get, about, I get, I get about anything say. that gets posted these days because. Many times it does come out that it was a, a, a or play. he's he knows he's going to get a lot of attention and limelight because the it, the, the movie's going to do what it's going to do regardless. It's it's now that like he has this this shining attention. It's like I'm going to go ahead and put out my own thoughts and agendas and political so, stances and whatever because I feel like now I have this platform that everybody's paying so, attention. To so me. here's so here's what I so I'll read you what the quote what the tweet said and then I have my own theory. <laughs> see, what what does that say? See the Doug highlighted. What does it say? <laughs> Low T is probably why this took him ten years to get it. Out. <laughs> the Avatar sequel, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> took him ten years. Yeah. So so <laughs> here's great, what he wrote and then I'll tell you what my theory is. This is the tweet. A lot of things I did earlier I wouldn't do career wise and just risks that you take as a wild testosterone poisoned young man. I always think of testosterone, testosterone poison. As, I know, as a toxin that you have to slowly work out of your system. Here's what I think. I think- Dude, who is he hanging out with? I, no, I think- <laughs> Could you be more beta? I think some <laughs> shit is going to come out about James Cameron when he was younger. I think either he got confronted uh, or some bullshit some came out and he's trying to make it like, yeah, I was a testosterone- no, you're just or something? You're just a young, stupid kid. That's probably, you know, that's what it was. not your testosterone- Interesting. That that's what I think. That, no, that's not a bad theory either. Yeah. I think- That's why, to me, there's like more, more that meets the eye here. Like, I don't think that- it's as simple as maybe this is like really what he believes. There's probably some sort of play here, whether it is to be get ahead of something yep. that may potentially come out later so he can use that as his defense and say, that, you know, a, a apology or whatever, or my well, point of just creating drama talking about is him. Is he all in on the whole climate issues and veganism? And like, I mean, I think he's like attached to all that stuff, right? Uh, maybe. Uh, well, I know. Okay, here's one thing I can throw shade on him, though. Like, I know he... For sure, put out like a statement a long time ago that like he had all these same ideas of Star Wars and was really mad when it came out that like he didn't put his out uh, at that. Yeah, he literally said like he came up with like the Everybody same has that premise to Star like, Wars. When I do comes out like I invent. I yeah, have, like I had that idea. I like, had that idea. Hey, well, thank God hey. you didn't put it out because it'd been dog hey, shit. Hey, my dad does that except not. He didn't invent it. Italians invented it. I don't care what it is. You know, an Italian was the first one. To, I had a friend to come up with. That idea. I'm like, come on, Dad. Everybody, yeah. everything. We've invented everything. <laughs> They're listening in on my conversations. Yeah. No, I, 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 it's it annoys the shit out of me because it promotes this narrative. First off, that somehow testosterone is a bad hormone. It's not a bad hormone. It's just a hormone. And a man that has balanced, healthy testosterone levels is less likely to be mentally ill, less likely to be negatively aggressive. Because here's the thing: there's a lot of confusion. People like testosterone increases aggression. People think aggression means like I'm going to go beat someone up or push someone down or get in their face. That's not aggression. That's being an asshole. Aggression is like I'm aggressive to hit my goals. I'm motivated to work harder. I'm motivated to be a better father. 
That's aggression. Now, of course, you could be an a, like a, a a violent type individual, but that's not the aggression they're talking about. So, I hate that they continue to perpetuate this bullshit narrative, like the toxic masculinity thing. You know what's funny about that? Men who display what they would consider I'm gonna do in quotations because I don't I, I hate that they named it this, but men who display the quote unquote toxic masculinity, the vast majority of them lacked masculinity in their lives. They didn't have a good role model that was yep. a man that taught them how to be a good man. They're overcompensating. And they not only overcompensate, they become the masculine that they see in media. And what do you see in media right. with masculinity? Violence, you know, you know, bang your chicks and hoes and this and that. And I, that's toxic. So if you want to talk about contributing toxic masculinity, it's, it's popular media. It's not men. Mm -hmm. So men need men in their lives so that they don't become what the media says that men are supposed to be through, again, through popular media. So crazy. Noise. Be dangerous. <laughs> you know, today, <laughs> today we have to uh, mention Viore. And I, so the last time that we got, like they send us stuff every month, right? So the guys and I all get like, uh, like a fit that they'll send us. That's normally what's like new or whatever. And they sent me these corduroy pants that I actually sat in my closet for probably those ones. No, not these. Oh. These are, these are actually Patagonia. What, that's what made me think of that right now is I'm wearing Patagonia uh, corduroys right now. And I actually don't like them nearly as much as I like the Viore's. Well, my point I was making was that I had them for like three months and I didn't wear them because I didn't think I was going to like them. I'm not like a huge corduroy guy, but I, I, I do like, I do like these and I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to like those. I put them on unbelievably comfortable. They're, they're soft. They have a, they have an elastic band. So they, they, so they stretch on the waist. So they're way more comfortable. They're tapered more than these Patagonias, which I, I like better too. And now like I fell in love with them. And it's my first pair that I've had. They're called the uh, optimist. Hmm. So, and I, I went on the other day to buy and like the color I want, I wanted this color in them and they're completely sold out in that color right now oh, because, man. and so obviously they're, well, they're, I'm wearing their slacks right now and yeah. I could literally I could work out in these slacks. That's how comfortable and stretchy, but they, they look like professional slacks. It was pretty funny at the live event because there was, uh, you know, they only have like three different colors of flannels. And uh, oh, I, made, yeah. <laughs> I made friends with, you know, <laughs> other people that were wearing their flannels and like, it's like, oh man, we all had the same idea that day. It was like all white. I'm so glad I didn't like, wear mine. Yeah, you I would have. The, I have the same one that you, I ran out and bought it. The the after I saw you wear it that day, I really I like grays, grays and whites. Or like I wear a lot of grays and whites, and I didn't know they had that. And when I saw you wearing it, I'm like, Dude, oh, let's talk about this live yeah, event that but we they're just great. did. This was a, my favorite. It was the best. It was my favorite. It was my favorite. I I felt like we were. Um, are most comfortable. Uh, the people that showed up were, I mean, they're always awesome. We always meet. We were also, uh, you know, we are at home, right? Yeah. So that, I wonder if, I wonder yep. if that played in a, a role at all. Do you think home that base? Played a, you know what I think it was? When was the last one that Maybe we did? A little, almost three years, Ohio. So there's a lot of, there's, cause okay. So here's the thing. We're not media people. When we started the podcast, we were trainers and we get better at presenting ourselves just through practice, right? Mm -hmm. Just do through doing the podcast, getting on the show. It's just like, it's reps, right? It's like an exercise. You just get better and better and better. I think it was three years of practice. And then we went and, you know, we got to talk to an audience and we just felt. Oh, so you think it was that? That's what I think. Huh. I think. Because watch I mean, our podcast three years ago versus now. And you see a big difference. I, I, I Two things I felt were, were really impactful. Um, our staff, man, is the, our team now. Um, this is the best I've ever felt. The best organized for sure. Yeah, but I mean, we we're we're starting to build a a pretty large team, and everybody's been in their position for the most part. Everyone's been in their position for quite some time now, and uh, uh, for some people, this was their first live event to experience. And I felt like um, the way they expedited everything was incredible. A lot of times, I feel like you know, and I know Doug can probably attest to this too. Like uh, it was stressing out during those things, like something not working or oh, the, the, yeah. the flow. I mean, it felt so smooth for me that that's all I had to think about was enjoying our people and, mm -hmm. and speaking. Right. It didn't, I didn't have to think about the logistics because so much of that was taken care of for us. That played a big role for me of actually being able to feel comfortable and just talk to our people. And then I actually think your idea, the trivia was so fun. I thought that was, yeah, that was really a fun question. That was a yeah. really clever idea because it what it did was not only did it give away a bunch of cool products to people, so everybody loved that, but uh, it act organically uh, made us go down memory lane and tell like some old stories of, of everybody. I Do you know the person cool. who answered the question about who's been to jail was not a listener. She someone brought her. 
she came to me afterwards and she goes, I don't know you guys. I came with so-and-so. By the way, I loved the event. I think you guys are awesome. I'm going to start listening. She goes, I just guessed. I just looked up there <laughs> and guessed. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was dying about that. Oh, oh man. I guess I got a face for that. Well, there was <laughs> there was somebody who there was somebody who guessed completely wrong on one that I thought was like one of the most obvious ones. I thought that was maybe the person who did No, because no. there was a remember that one? That was uh it was what was the question? And she was way off. Everybody, I felt like the whole audience knew, but her yeah. who it was, and she was like, um, um, and I think she. Do you guys, do you guys like I slipped in that one question? Like, who is always right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm asking. Yeah. I'm the one giving away the prizes too. Yeah. Better answer this correctly. Because what, what did you think, Doug, of of the event? I loved it. I mean, it was easy for me as well. All I had to do was worry about the audio, and that that was it. And uh, everybody- like, I never saw you stressed. No, no, I, I didn't need time, to be. I, I didn't need to be stressed, right? We had a massive crew of people handling yeah. all the details, so yeah. it was the sound great. Was on point, so yeah. You're, I uh, I like my so my favorite part about I think we didn't lose any money too, so I thought I like that part. Yeah, well, yeah, they don't make us money. Like people, I mean, we don't do this to make money. The reason why we do selfishly, people would think because they, you sell them, you go like oh, no, that, but they bail, we, no. we got to pay the staff. <laughs> we got to pay. You know, uh, you know, we had a we rented out a, a bar or lounge for a holiday party. Then we invited about, I don't know, was it 10 of the mm -hmm. the people that came that, you know, they actually did the VIP, you know, experience or whatever. We do sick gift bags too that we don't tell people about. Yeah. So, um, yeah. so it doesn't make us money, but we do this selfishly because we've talked about this so many times. The There's something that we lost when we started doing this and we stopped training people in person. And and the thing that we started to lose was the, just being grounded. Because it's one thing to hear, like I read comments on YouTube or, or, or we get DMs. It's not the same as when you meet someone and you see the impact and you know you're, what you're doing is right or wrong, or maybe I should communicate that different. When you're a trainer, you get that. You get to see the person. You get to guide them along the process. We don't get that when we do this. And so we start to, we start to become less grounded mm -hmm. and becomes more and more of this like show. And when we do these, these live events, it brings me back and I feel like a damn trainer again. I love it. It makes me feel better. It makes me feel more driven. Yeah. It was, it was good too. It gives you feedback of like, you know, what you're presenting and like what people are picking up on that you didn't realize like it brought them value or didn't bring them value or whatever. And uh, so that's why I want to bring up some conspiracy theory right now, just because <laughs> I had a lot of people like, I appreciate when you bring in some, uh, some of these like unknown type of uh, conspiracies <laughs> that uh, turn out to be true. Oh, weird, right? <laughs> now you said, I might not know this one. You oh, might not know this one. This is one I just, uh, somebody sent me and I thought it was pretty cool and, uh, you know, something that uh, makes makes sense. So apparently there was this video game that uh, was an arcade game that it had made its way to an arcade. I don't know where exactly it was. They weren't real specific in in this video, uh, but Polybius is, was the name of the title of the game. And the game was like, ahead of its time like graphics everything was like super like uh futuristic for for the time period i think it was like in the 70s uh and uh, i guess there was like a, always a, a crazy line for it and there's actual fist fights around being able to play this game uh unfortunately there was like side effects to this game so they go home and they had like migraines they had what? like all of these like like uh, somebody had had a seizure finally where they ended up having to bring it off the market that's it right there yeah and so it it says well, the most dangerous arcade game so so this is like speculative this isn't like totally fact checked though so it's like it's been circulating and I didn't know this was a thing. Like even the Simpsons had like a little reference to it. Of course they did. Uh, yeah. Cause they're, they they're on top everything. of everything. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, yeah. like if you go through all their stuff, but I didn't know about this and uh, I thought it was interesting. So they think that uh, like black suits came in and then like they would kind of like take data from it. And so that like, it was like a grand kind of like, uh, uh, human psychology experiment. Oh, so like oh, try and gather data on yes. people that played it. Like, yes. let's see if we what? can alter behaviors. If they can alter behaviors, if they could, you induce... know, manipulate their minds somehow uh, through this game that they're playing. So Shut up. that I was like tripping out. I'm like, wow, they had this all the way back then. Imagine where we are now. So here's, I mean, I, I uh, may, it seems like a, a well, seems plausible. Well, yeah, so right? here's, plausible. Here's why I think it's plausible. Maybe not with Polybius. Maybe so. But here's why I think it's plausible. Let's say you wanted to do an experiment on a grand scale. Uh, one of the best ways to yeah. do it would be to create a product or an app right. or a social media app or something like that 
that people will adopt on their own. For example, somebody told uh, me this one. TikTok. Oh, yeah. The well, one where you age. Yeah. Remember how yes. much data they got from us? Yes. That was Russia, right? Yes. Yeah. So somebody actually said this to me once and they said, Sal, they said, how could agencies collect personal data on you uh, for free? Where they, where you voluntarily tell them what you like, what you're reading, post pictures of your family and yourself. You create a killer product like things, that you just have to provide yeah, that. Like things that you don't, that you like, dislike yeah. things that you don't like. Like, could you imagine if Incoming you came up with- Facebook. Yeah. And I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> it's the ultimate hack for uh, intelligence. It is. So either they could, they could be a part of creating it or they could, you know, they got their back doors or whatever set up. Who was it? We were talking to some, oh yeah, I can't, I'm not gonna say too much because I don't want to give this person out. But the, this person we were talking to worked at, at high levels of intelligence. And I, him and I got in this conversation. I don't know if you guys oh, know. Yeah, I know who you're talking about. Okay, yes. you and I were yeah, talking. I yeah, yeah, we were talking to I'll him. I'll tell you off air because oh. you, you were there de too. Everything's deliberate. You I'm were there too. To you just weren't, you were talking to the other guy. Yeah, okay. He was like high level military. So, okay. He used to be high level military. Okay, tell me. And he said 100% they have, they 100% have back doors. They go in there. They control algorithms if they want. Mm -hmm. They do what the fuck they want. And yeah. either the company doesn't know because they do it so well. Or they do, Pure and, they autonomy. Can't, and they can't do anything about it. Yeah. So, <laughs> no. Anyways. Yeah. <laughs> I also, like, I want to kind of bring up a, a bit of a commercial, too, that uh, for ButcherBox, that it was interesting because Courtney decided to do kind of a little social experiment of her own, and uh, she makes killer spaghetti. And it's it's the best. It's really meaty. There's meatballs. There's sausage. Oh, did you finally try the meatballs? So she, she snuck in ButcherBox meatballs. And also her own meatballs, and then just kind of like blended them together, and like that's a dangerous experiment. That could go bad for her. It could go bad. It Wait, could go on. bad, or it could you know? Butcher Box has meatballs, or the meat you had. Yes, to I yeah, they got them. meatballs, oh, and they're already they're like amazing, ready to go. Yeah. I was so blown away by them, how good they were. Yeah, so they were good, and Courtney's are really good too. So it was like I, yeah, I had no idea. It actually was pretty similar. Like the, I couldn't really distinguish the two. Uh, you know, and I, I tried to kind of lean and tell her that hers were. Obviously <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was gonna say, did she trap I'm you? Still trying to. I was gonna say that's why lady, that could right? be a dangerous experiment, yeah. bro. I think you get set up a little <laughs> it's bit, like, like a trap, you know. Oh, these butcher box ones, they're all right. Yeah, yeah. Like, hey, babe, <laughs> she wanted like feedback from the, the kids. She's sitting hey, there like she hears this. a commercial next week. Those butcher box meatballs were amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so what you're saying, Justin, is they're almost as good as Courtney's. <laughs> almost, almost as good as that's Courtney's. Pretty damn good. That's pretty damn good. I got your back. So good job. Have you had yet, Doug? I haven't. You guys got to get them. I. I, we've now, or I think this is the third go around that we've got them. Because I, have to, we, I haven't seen them. So what is like, it? The add-ons? Must be. All right. I, I yeah, this is the You're ultimate the test. Is the Italian I'm test. I'm going to look right? them up. Oh, that's true. You got to put the Italian test in. Yeah. Too. It's a meat the ball. You know, can I tell you something right now? Italians don't eat meatballs in their pasta. Just they just we just don't. Oh, it's really? not. No, that's an American thing. Uh, is it? Yes. Oh. We eat meatballs by themselves. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, dude. Oh, that's interesting. You know how many, you know how many dishes <laughs> Americans that's invented? Americans did right though. And they, they create, invent it, and say it's you know they yeah. do this with all kinds like like Mexican food. Like do you know sushi. what else? Like a chalupi. I'm sure chalupa pizza is totally different too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do you know what else is interesting about Americans? I find it really interesting that there was like record sales in Black Fridays yep. this year. Well, we are in this crazy time. I feel like I called that inflation layoffs and we saw Dude, record yeah, sales crazy, in there's some economic what data. The hell ec there's some economic data that's coming out. That's still showing that yeah, it's is nobody worried anymore. Like it's, well, no, what's happening is that it's starting to heat up, meaning the Fed has to raise rates more aggressively, probably mm. because it's not working like they thought. That's are sucks. we going to see Yikes. like crazy stuff? Like it was it was it the uh, 80s, Doug, when the like the early 80s, when the thir 13, 13, 14, 15 percent interest rates on, uh -huh. on homes and stuff were? Yeah, I mean, I think it was late 70s or 80s, yep. you know, yeah. during the Carter administration and it rolled over. Yeah, Rogan came Reagan. in and I think I was not Rogan, excuse me, Reagan. And it was Volcker, right? Volkner? Paul, Paul Volcker. Yeah, he had yeah. to raise interest rates to crash. So here's inflation. a funny story. I, I don't remember how old I was, but I had like $10,000 I'd saved up and I got a CD at 18%. Holy crap. 18%. 18%. Oh. So that, that this is one of the positive things about this. You could put it in like a guaranteed CD and make it yeah. fat percentage. Well, those are already starting to come back up, by the way, too. So that's the positive side of all that happening is what, to encourage people to put money back in the bank and save. We should see a, a rise in like interest rates on bank accounts and CDs and stuff like that. So there, there is there yeah. is a, a silver lining in some of the stuff that's, that's a going positive. on. Yeah. Wow. 
That's wild. But I, I just think it's wild that we what we've gone through in the last year or two, and and of course with all the, the news and, and inflation, and I just thought for sh- and the layoffs, I thought for sure this was going to be kind of a, a murky, uh, you know, Black Friday. But I heard so many companies broke records. Now here's the other the other side of it is that maybe because people are starting to tighten up, and maybe because because here's what happens, and this is how inflation can become runaway. When people start to think, I need to buy this now because it's going to be way too expensive a year from now, then you get runaway inflation. I think that's then people ha- start to snatch So I think up. that's been happening yeah. already. So my theory- You don't on- think on Black Friday, everyone's like, take advantage and buy all the shit you can't not. So my theory is that the, there is a, a, a big percentage of people that uh, took advantage of these low interest rates in houses and bought in the last- three years or before, so three years and beyond, um, and actually if you bought two years and beyond, uh, you are almost anywhere in the country, you're sitting on anywhere between 50 on the low end probably to as high as half a million dollars in equity. Mm. And I think, and I remember being a 23-year-old kid and sitting on a quarter million dollars in equity in my first house and thinking I was rich. Uh, it, it was and think and thinking in my head, so that, they don't feel the pressure. Yeah, like it's like you know, even with all the bad stuff going on, and and, and by the way, I remember at that time. Okay, I remember when uh, there was a comp plan change and my income got reduced, and I didn't slow down spending because in my head, I I justified my credit card spending because I had a quarter million dollars in my bank account in a mm, sense, right? I, if, if I really needed to, I could pull a home equity line and I would be totally fine. I could live off of that. Yeah, because home prices have dropped a little bit, but not a ton. No, no, and not if you had your house beyond three years. I mean, if you bought last year, you know, now and, and now, then like, yeah, you're, you're probably flat or hurting a little bit, but not a big deal. If you bought four, five, 10, I mean, you're sitting on so much equity right now that I bet a lot of people feel so the real safe. pain isn't going to happen until the that house dips. prices really start to dip. That's what I think. That's because so many so many people have their wealth tied up in that. Right. I mean that's I mean that's very true. I think that's very true. Hey, so I want to share with you guys a study that Arthur Brooks shared with me. Arthur mm-hmm. Brooks, one of my favorite people in the world, by the way. It's just a such a great guy. If you if you don't know who he is, you got to look him up. It's just a super intelligent man. He's a Harvard professor. Uh, and I tell everybody to watch that documentary, The Pursuit. Oh, it's so you good. He's, a, he's an economist, but he's also a, be, a behavioral scientist, um, and his expertise is on happiness. And but anyway, a, and just a great human. He shared this fascinating study on brain changes in men after becoming fathers. Oh, and it was actually a well done study. So oh, it was yeah. like they did controls and all that stuff. So this is like real brain changes due to men becoming fathers. You ready for this? Yeah, I'm here. So I, I read the whole study. It's really deep. And I didn't spend a lot of time on it. And so I just texted him and because he sent it to me. And I texted him. I said, what is this? Like, could, do you have a few seconds to kind of tell me what's going on here with the study? This is what he sent me. He says, you have more, this is after you become a dad, you have more synapses dedicated to your pair uh, band and to defending and caring for your kids. He says, it's like you're mentally ready to fight a hyena and more in love with your wife. And he goes, it makes you manlier in the good ways. Huh. How awesome is that? Yeah. I definitely feel the, um, so I you mean, got, Ka- Katrina felt that she'd tell you that the, the love she received from me after our son, mm-hmm. uh, was so different than the pre pre previous. It's true. It's true. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, no, there's, but the, mean, the, the two parts were really wild. It's, it's that, that you, that you're more, you want to bond with your partner more. Mm-hmm. But also the synapses that make you defend and care for your young. Yeah. Also, now, you, how, you want to you, honor them, and then yeah, you also want to be the provider, the protector. Like it's just this crazy, overwhelming feeling. It's like this, this it, literally, your brain is wiring itself. Okay, I know you way. didn't go deep into it, but the, I mean, how do you know how they were measuring this? Like how? Were yeah, they, they were before cool. and after uh, MRI uh, imaging. So this is a this was a longitudinal longitudinal gray matter. Um, cortical volume reductions and, and there's evidence from two international samples and they use brain imaging. 
So it's like they had good controls. They had they tested them afterwards and they tested them later. So it was a really well done. So study. yeah, because it in contrast to that, wasn't there like a study saying like there's a natural decline in testosterone because of like lack of sleep and all that? Well, that all that or? was different, and yeah. that's short term, and that I think might be more related to the fact that there's lack of sleep and yeah. more stress and that kind of stuff. That's kind of because what, what they tried to speculate was oh lower testosterone, but no, again, yeah, it's make you <laughs> nicer. That's yeah. actually yeah. not true. Yeah. That's not true at all. Again, if you if you if you study men who who have low testosterone and raise their testosterone, they become less irritable, less depressed, less anxious, Maybe basically send happier. That to uh, James Cameron. James Cameron. <laughs> yeah. See if you can read a little bit. Sneak him a little shot. You, uh, have, I mean, you probably haven't watched any TV whatsoever. I finally got these guys to watch Bullet Train. What did you guys think of it? Did you guys Sick. Like it? Great movie. I enjoyed it. I thought it was fun. Yeah. I mean, maybe I didn't like it as much as you did. I loved it. What's it about? You normally are right on page with Justin loved it though, huh? It was awesome. Yeah. What's it about? It had action pack, had a witty dialogue, like very um uh kind of Quentin Tarantino meets uh what's the other guy director? Ritchie. Yeah, guy Ritchie. Who's, who's in it? Brad, Brad Pitt. Pitt, Brad Pitt. There was all kinds of cameos oh, too. Oh, I saw a bunch of like British actors. I saw the trailer for it. it okay. The trailer looks like shitty. Oh I didn't watch it for like two months when it was out because I didn't think the trailer looked interesting. Watched it one night with Trent. Now, granted, it's a fun movie. I was telling Doug this. I was like, granted, I went into it thinking, oh, this won't be very good. And so it exceeded. So it exceeded my expectations. I hyped it up like crazy to Doug. And so he was like ready oh. for the movie of the and year. And we got like, to watch it in our uh, new theater. Yeah. Uh, at how, the cool, Utah how cool place. is that? Actually, no, I did watch so something. So fun. I did watch something. Uh, Wednesday. The series Wednesday. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. The extension of Really? I like it. Did you watch it? Yeah. Really good. Yeah, cool. good. Really, really good writing. Yeah. It's it, it, very good writing. It's obviously like a mystery, and she's you know trying to find a murder or it's whatever. On Netflix, yeah. Really clever writing. Really well done. I didn't think I would like it. My daughter kept talking about it. Oh, I love it. I love it. Love it. And so you know, Jessica and I watched some of it. It's really good. Yeah. We, we really it's missed good. you though, uh, going out to Utah. That was a, a really cool experience to see that finally all. It's been such a long project. Now. Yeah. And, yeah. stressful and it's it's cool to see and i tell you what i i really uh, uh doug will attest to this too like we were really nervous about your choice of color in the in the kitchen because originally when it first got finished and it was the furniture had just started yeah. to come in yeah it didn't look good it, and now it now looks great yeah yeah it really, good job sal you're yeah. well yeah there you go yeah. <laughs> are you sure you're not just trying to make me feel better yeah. right now because no no i i to your designer I, I, yeah. doug and i went there you know it's the only th it's that's what i'm not a big like i don't have a lot of opinion on the way things look except for stonework and that's just uh, i grew up around it yeah. so that's it yeah it, it looked uh yeah, it came out real nice it did it came out really really good shout out to brooke who was incredible i mean she's she's, she's a great really, job with the furniture yeah she, all that we stuff. really leaned on heavily on her to go and, and pick out a lot of stuff for us and there was things that we originally wanted and we couldn't get because it was going to you know push it back months and so she really had to piece a lot of things together um i do want to say something on the podcast that i actually wasn't intending to do this until right now i just thought of this i want to I want to reach. I want anyone who is a um, a landscape photographer uh, to mm. to reach out to me via email at adam at mindpumpmedia .com if you would be interested in consigning professional photos in the house. Mm, yeah. So originally we we're going to go buy a bunch of this art. We bought some pieces, and I thought you know what would be even cooler is to find an artist who oh, photographs. Yeah, you know, we landscape. Can highlight it in the house. Yeah, and we'll highlight it in the house. And we're then, not gonna put your competing pictures up in there. And make it look. No, no, no. <laughs> the one you were on the bear rug. It's very, it's very. <laughs> there's very little mind pump. Uh, anything in there right now, other so, than like our. So partner. for people who don't know, the idea is that this is a a rental that is all optimized. So red light therapy, cold dip, sauna, PRX gym. Like, Ullers, Uller, like theater, in the beds, steam, like, steam, movie so you, theater. Jacuzzi. So you go in there, and then there, we'll also have you know some of our partners will provide supplements and products. So you'll go in there, and you're in this amazing place near Park City. So it's all the stuff to do, but also in the house itself. Yeah. It's like all the stuff that we talk about and you could optimize the shit yes. out of your day. We had another kind of funny moment where Doug was uh, sort of editing and whatnot and decided to kind of throw up the uh, podcast on the theater screen. Oh, yeah. And then there's Sal, like huge <laughs> I wasn't Sal. even there. You guys and we were me? all sitting in the theater watching <laughs> your your mug. Like, yeah. We were going to send a video. Yeah, we're, we're like, like, oh, Sal would love this oh, right now. Yeah, he would just love this. He would just, just drink it in. Did you, did you guys know? get caught up in yeah. one of my, one yeah, of my we, stories? Yeah, 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 yeah. We went on a This guy's amazing. Journey man, it's so amazing. Shut up. You're, so stupid. <laughs> You're so dumb. Hey, did you guys see? So, you know, can I tell you guys right now? You want to talk about serendipitous? Uh, I got kicked off Twitter. Right. Uh, sorry, Instagram. Everybody freaked out for a second. I yeah. got kicked off Instagram 
went to Twitter, and then Elon bought Twitter, yeah. and now Elon, uh, now Twitter is amazing. Yeah, Twitter is becoming amazing. It's pretty and I feel like it was to watch. It was perfect timing because I got myself a little bit of a follower. I don't have a huge follower base. I just got on there not that long ago, but it is amazing place right now. And I don't know if you guys did saw. You this. See, did you see? Did you go ahead? Sorry. Well, no, I got to tell you. I don't. Maybe this is what you're going to say. So the <laughs> the White House or Biden Biden's tweet or whatever got fact checked. Remember the fact checking yeah, yeah. on social oh. media? And it was obviously half the time the fact checking was bullshit. It's it, still kind of uh, rampant. Well, no, on Twitter, it's pretty balanced. And check this out. This is amazing. So Biden puts out a tweet and it says, we're building an economy from the bottom up and the middle out by creating more jobs than any administration in history at this point in a presidency. And then here's the fact check. Hmm. <laughs> That's so yeah. great. This graph misleadingly credits Biden for the creation of new jobs. The spike in jobs is more accurately attributed to the lifting of COVID-19 restrictions at the state and local level. These are not new jobs, but instead jobs that are returning to the economy, <laughs> yeah. which is People true. People going back to work. Which is true. That's yeah. 100% true. Yeah. But how wonderful yeah, is that? taking credit I, for What that. I thought was really cool. That, like propaganda is not going to work. Like you know what I thought was really cool was uh, Tim Cook taking him to lunch real quick. Did oh, you see that? Yeah, because he said, didn't he so, say that Apple? So there was kick? rumors that were going around that Apple was going to remove Twitter from their app store. And so he basically put a tweet out saying, like, that would be really unfortunate. I would hate to go have to make a competitive product to iPhone. <laughs> Fucking three days later, Tim Cook is having lunch with his ass. <laughs> no way. <laughs> yes, I dude. Love it. Yes, dude. Just letting him know. We have he no is intention. that gangster where we have I mean, no intention of doing that whatsoever. You believe <laughs> don't, him too. Don't sleep oh, on yeah. it. oh, bro, imagine even even okay. He's a wizard. Yes. Even if he's not gonna go take it down, I don't think Tim Cook in the but oh, he will definitely take a bite out of your pie for yeah. sure. Well, have you seen and the, that's the, your golden goose? Have yeah. you seen the Twitter data? Their their users have gone up significantly. Tweets. Oh, is that up. true? I thought it was the other way. No. So they've lost some advertising revenue, which is true. But if you go to Elon's page, he lists he lists the graphs. He's very like here, here's the numbers. Here's what's going on. I'd have to scroll down to look at it. But he posted a bunch of like their data, and they're actually crushing right now. What do you think about him taking Kanye down? I think uh, that I that was interesting. Oh well. Bro, Kanye has really has lost have you his seen mind. Is Alex Jones? Well, interview? yeah, bro, he's yeah, really gone crazy. He did? He, why, why he? You know why he got he got removed from Twitter, right? No. Oh yeah, he posted a a swastika inside the Star of David. Yeah. And so that well, was well, I mean, that was on, the dude. tweet he's that got literally out of his mind. Oh, yeah. Come on, bro. Yeah, no. Oh, I mean, here we go. Look at this. New user signups are at an all time high. User active minutes at an all time high. Hate speech impressions are lower. And reported impersonations are down all since he took over. That's damn good. Could yeah. you imagine he turns this into one of the top social media companies after going where they were like one of the worst now? I mean, yeah. My, my, favorite, my favorite meme was the one that the guy wrote that uh, Elon, uh, breaking news, Elon comes out, will be charging uh, people with pronouns they, them in their bio will now get charged $16. For a more, a double the eight. <laughs> <laughs> Is there more than one person? <laughs> I fell out of my chair. Uh, I thought that was so good. good. <laughs> that's not true, no, but it's a funny meme. It's just funny. a joke. All right, so uh, here at the end, what we've been doing now is 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 shouting out people on Instagram or social media that we really like. Justin, you said you have. Yeah, I did have somebody that uh, like Adam and I kind of referenced him a few times. It always puts out like really incredible athletic type training um, exercises and content and all that. It's it's real game dot athletics. Oh yeah, yeah. That's so. his I like that guy a lot. Yeah, I wanted to make sure people knew that he does like a lot of plyometrics and things that are very sports specific that uh, I think people get a lot of value. Super out. unique. Give I him like a follow. That. Hey, what kind of training do you do? Uh, do you like to do strength training, weightlifting, Olympic lifting, bodybuilding? PRX has it all for your home gym and it's designed to maximize space. For example, they have a squat rack that folds into the wall, comes off the, the wall like five inches. Then you pull it away from the wall and it's the most sturdy at home squat rack you'll find anywhere. But anyway, all their equipment is like this super high quality, commercial grade home gym equipment. You can even make payments on it. So you can just pay monthly. Go check this company out. It's the best home gym equipment you'll find anywhere. PRXperformance.com forward slash mind pump. And if you go through that link, you'll get a 5% discount. All right, here comes the rest of the show. 
First question is from Campos Junior 5 How do you find your ideal weight? I'm not sure where I should be. Okay, so there's a there's a bit there's of a challenge thing. with say what? Is there such a thing anymore? Yeah, well, I mean, I guess there is, but you have to paint context. Like, what's my ideal weight for uh, lifting the most weight in the gym or what's my ideal weight for having the less, the least amount of inflammation or having the most stamina. The longevity. I imagine this person is comfortable. I imagine this person is asking for health, right? Just I, overall. Yeah. I feel like that. I feel like if you were asking to be strong, to be fast, you would add that to that. If you're like, what's my ideal weight? I feel like that's a question that is, uh, for someone who's looking, just I want to be healthy. What 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 should my weight be? Yeah. If, so if that's the context of it, now I could give general answers. I uh, for men, a body fat percentage that probably sits between ten to sixteen percent is probably is is like the range of healthy for women. It's like you know sixteen to twenty, maybe four percent, something like that might be considered healthy. But I really think it, it it's you, it's not paying attention to your weight, but rather paying attention to how you feel. Uh, are your workouts making you feel good? Do you feel mobile? Do you not feel lots of joint pain? Are you sleeping well? Do you eat a diet where you feel healthy? You have good digestion. You're not force feeding yourself. You're not also super restricting yourself. And then where does that weight put you? Like wh what's your body weight when you feel like your life is very balanced and you feel very healthy? And then that is probably close to what would be your ideal weight yeah. in, in that I sense. wish the medical community put more emphasis on body composition, you know, yeah. too, because it, you know, they're still going by overall weight. And, you know, I understand when there's like morbidly obese people, like the big concern is to like, you know, lower the weight. So there's not so much stress on vital organs and, you know, there's a concern there, but in, in terms of like overall health, you'll get muscular people that, uh, you know, might be a little bit higher on the weight, but, um, you know, their composition. I mean, they're in thriving health and, and able bodies. So I, even body fat percentages is, is, is tough because it, it, if it's for health, uh, there's so many other things that affect health. For example, I, I find sure. this really interesting about my own personal journey. Um, I have, I've been as, as low as probably 180 pounds to as high as 240 pounds. And I've been every body fat percentage from 2% all the way up to 20% at all those. So I've had a yeah. huge range and I'm probably somewhere right now, I would say probably 14, 15% body fat. So I'm on the higher end of body fat percentage. I would think for what I would consider like fit or healthy for myself right now. You think so? You look more like 13, 12. Yeah, maybe. Okay. I mean, I, I'd, I'd rather estimate on the higher end and then I come sure. in a little lower, but say, let's say 13 to 15%. Sure. Okay. So I'm 13, which is, on the higher end for me, I, yeah. for most of my training career, I, I, I hovered around 10, 11. So let's say I'm 13, 15% right now, body fat, give or take. Um, I, and I definitely don't look as, as good as I do when I'm, I'm much leaner. I feel some of the healthiest I've ever felt in my mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. um, and just a lot of that is the, the other things that are balanced out, right? I feel like, um, I'm, I'm, I'm eating a consistently better choice of food. Doesn't mean that I don't indulge every once in a while. I do, but then I'm, I'm right back on track. I don't, I'm not like going off the rails for long periods of time. Um, I'm getting, I'm getting relatively good sleep in comparison to what I, what I have in the past. Uh, my libido is really high. So my hormones are all balanced out. So, you know, here I am at the, the at a higher end of body fat percentage for me. And I feel the healthiest I've ever What's felt. What's your body weight? Um, two twenty, about two twenty five. I'd say I am. Would you say that this is right around then, kind of idealish for you because you feel so healthy? I, I, I think I would be even better around two fifteen. Okay. Uh, I think I would, I would feel even better. So I don't think I'm the the uh, the healthiest I could be. I think I could be. Even well, this healthier. brings up a good a good point though because my point is how nuanced it can be though. Yeah, right? and also the balance aspect of it because you could try to drop, let's say 3% body fat, but that might require you take away from something in your life right now that you're finding right. more value from. That's right. why this is like a tough- It's a tough one. It's so individualized, man. Cause yeah. like, I mean, I had to go kind of to the extremes to find like where that range is, uh, you know, for me personally, even having to gain a ton of weight for football, I was like, I'm like, I am not comfortable with this. Even though it was a lot of muscle, uh, there's a lot of fat on top of the muscle, but it was just like carrying a substantial amount more weight. 
I just didn't move well. I didn't sleep well. Like there's, there's factors, I guess that that's kind of the assessment there is to kind of checkpoint all those things. Like what kind of quality sleep am I getting? Uh, you know, how much energy do I have? Like, uh, how strong do I feel? And just kind of go through all those things and feel where that weight kind of resides. And, and, and then also where your life is. Yeah. I think the longer you do this, if your pursuit is is honest and you're really trying to create balance and longevity and, and do this for a long time and not be super extreme, or maybe you do experiment with the extremes, which I think does give you some insight. Then you tend to find out what that number is for you. Uh, you know, I've, I've been, I, you know, I've been as low as, uh, you know, when I competed in jujitsu, I was like 190, 185 to 190. I've gotten my body weight as high as to almost 240 which for me is really, really heavy. I feel best between 205 to 210, 215, maybe 210. I'd say 210 is probably where I feel best, mm -hmm. just overall balanced and healthy. But there is a bit of a range there. And well, there's a range and there's also in relation to, right? Because you could technically get down to that 210, but then your sleep could be way off. You could be uh, ha fighting with your wife. You could not be- Maybe I'm not family. enjoying meals as much right, with my family. Right, right. And so it's, it's um, and I know this is not the answer this person but wants. I can tell you what a non-ideal body weight is for someone, right? right. I could do that. Right, I, right. And I think that's why I gave a range of body fat percentage and things to look for. I think an ideal body weight, here's the, the other myth is that there's a weight there's a specific number, like 207.5. You're just not going to get that. No, it's probably a range. You're probably going to have a range of body weight that's within 10 to 15 pounds, depending on how short you are or whatever, 10 to 15 pounds. And what determines if you're on the lower end or the higher end is your life. Like, uh, I just had a baby. I'm probably not going to work out as much or as intensely as I did before I had a newborn because my sleep isn't going to be as good. There's more responsibilities now, especially in the first, you know, six months to a year. So my body fat percentage is probably not going to be, it's going to fluctuate a little bit. And this happens for everybody. You may have an illness. You may feel more motivated, at sometimes less motivated. Maybe you're more into doing things or, or, or other parts of your life that maybe make you add a little bit of body fat. But there is a range. And I think the way, the best way to ask this is what's your ideal range of body weight? And that's something you kind of find uh, through experimenting with balance uh, with your workouts and diet and sleep and lifestyle. Next question is from Hubie Swole. I normally train with high intensity, but leave a rep or two in the tank. Is going to failure every set better for hypertrophy? Though. <laughs> yeah. the question. No, it's not. Just, yeah. you, um, okay, so think of going to fail. First off, intensity is important. So you definitely want to work with a certain level, work out with a certain level of intensity. Failure is when you lift the weight until you can't lift it anymore, okay? But you could still get close to that where you stop about two reps before that, and that's still intense training. Think of failure training as a novel stimulus. In other words, it's a way to switch things up, change things up uh, every once in a while to get your body to respond again or to change up your programming. Don't use uh, failure as a, this is what I do every single set. That is a very fast way to... Get your body to stop progressing. I mean, I, I, I look at it more like it's um, it's me testing my body because I've been putting all the good work in of training consistently and dieting consistently for a while. And now I just want to see like, oh, what happens when I push to failure? Like, is where's it, the line? Yeah, where's the line? Is it a new line? Have I have I increased my strength in this category? And I only need to do that one time and then I'm out of there. Mm -hmm. That's it. You don't need to. I don't need to be doing it every workout or multiple exercises in a workout. And I mean, this is one of the things that I see. uh TikTok uh, and 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 clips of ours where you know some some dumb kid will try and get on there and 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 argue and debate this conversation yeah. around hypertrophy and failure training and the the studies that are out there to support the benefits of that and it's just you you cannot take um you can't take one study uh, and and how it supports the benefits because there is benefits to going failure. We're not saying that there is not, but you have to use it right. You got to draw it out too and see how long that's going to benefit you. Right. It's not like it may be a brief window uh, of opportunity there, but yeah, I think uh, this is just one of those we always see is overused, and I think totally. that that's that's kind of our concern uh, is that uh, it's, you're you're more likely to overtrain and then like keep overtraining, which then doesn't provide that adaptation that you're actually seeking. So are you really doing what's best, uh, you know, with your training methods? Yeah, yeah it's such a good point because when people talk about the risk reward, uh, 
you know, factor with something like this. They, they think risk and they think like uh, injury. And so somebody who's like, oh, I'm a safe lifter. And so I'm not worried about getting hurt. And so there's not much risk for me. So I'm going to train to failure all the time to get the max benefits. But that's not the risk. I think the risk is, you know, overtaxing, overreaching totally. is the risk is it's less about, and yes, of course it's increased risk for injury too, but it's normally a hardcore fitness person that's attracted to the overtraining. Who's not that high of risk in injuring themselves per se, but more so of consistently overreaching and not allowing the body to properly recover yeah, and adapt. The problem is, is I have yet to see, and there's some well-programmed workouts out there and they typically reside in the, in the strength sports where it's like powerlifting, Olympic lifting, just because they're, they're such objective sports that yeah. workout programming has gone further it's there. Mathematical. Yeah. But, uh, I have yet to see really good workout programming that programs failure properly. It's either you always go to failure or you don't go to failure. You can program it properly, but it's got to be used as a novel stimulus. You know, stay tuned because we may uh, find a way to program this into programs for those of you that enjoy training with that intensity. But I will say this, with when you look at the data on training to failure, it's not necessary. Not only is it not necessary, if, if it doesn't seem to yield any better results. So my, my argument is, okay, so you're going to work out harder for the same results? I mean, I guess if you just like working out harder, that's fine. But my argument is most people overdo it. So unless you really know how to program and really know how to program in novel stimulus like failure, then you're better off uh, probably keeping one or two reps in the, in, in the tank most of the time. Next question is from Anasia. Steph, are supersets necessary if time is not an issue? No. No, but super. so supersets are great if time is an issue. Um, but what if it's not an issue? Why else would you use supersets? Still novel. Yeah, it's, yeah it is. Know. It's a very novel stimulus. Yeah. It's a great way to work on strength endurance. So uh, you know, I could do I could do a bench press for twenty five reps. So I'm going to work strength endurance there. But here's the difference between doing twenty five reps on a bench press or doing ten reps on a bench press and then ten reps of another chest exercise like a fly. Because I changed the movement pattern, I hit the muscles slightly differently. And it's uh, a novel stimulus. And bodybuilders love supersets for its ability to produce a crazy pump in the muscle. Um, and there's a, there's so many different ways to use supersets. So I use supersets when time isn't an issue still for those reasons right there. I like the pump. Yeah, I feel like this person's saying that because they've heard me say that on the show. That, that's your favorite way. Like. Yeah, that's my favorite way to do it. And, and there's enough times when I want to cut my workout short or I have to cut my workout short that it just intermittently ends up in my training. So I tend to save it for that. It's not that I don't think that there's value in it when I'm not hurt, I'm not in a rush. I mean, if you're somebody who always gets your hour to train your three to four days a week and you never miss that hour, and then you're like, well, I'm never in a hurry, so I'm not gonna use supersets because Adam only uses it for when he's, and it's like, no, don't do that. I mean, that's not my point. My, my point is that that tends to happen to most people enough times in, their, in the year of training that, uh, they have to cut a workout short or they have a smaller window than they anticipated. And so, or maybe they just don't feel like working out for an entire hour. To me, uh, those times present themselves of enough times in a, a, it's naturally programmed. Yeah. It's naturally programmed in there. I, I save it for those moments. Like, Oh, this is perfect. I'm yeah. still gonna get a great workout. I haven't done supersets in a while and I, I gotta get out of here. So that's how I use of it. Of all the strength athletes that, you know, or, or the athletes that use strength training as their primary form of training, it's bodybuilders that most use supersets. Mm -hmm. So that kind of gives you a clue in terms of what its value is. And the value is the pump, maybe sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, which is increasing the, the, the capacity of the muscle to store fluid capillaries, give you that kind of round full look. Um, and it's probably, it contributes to hypertrophy in, in, in maybe a novel way, especially if you never do them. So, uh, supersets definitely have value when used properly, meaning you don't do them all the time. You do them sometimes. And when you do them sometimes, especially if it's something you haven't done in a little while, I, you'll see some benefits. You'll see and feel some benefits from doing so. Next question is from CMOS23. If all affiliates are vetted for our interest, why do some get dropped? Did their product change? Oh, who picked this? I did. I'm glad you picked I this. Sure picked this. <laughs> I'm, gl I'm glad. I'm glad you picked I did this, this for uh, for you, Adam. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I, I we get a lot of questions uh, around this, and I don't think we've ever like addressed it. Um, sometimes the businesses just don't continue to align, and it has nothing to do with the product or the people. We could still love them. As a matter of fact, there's several brands that we've worked with. I'll name a few: uh, Doctor Squash. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, Thrive Market, um, Ease, Four Sigmatic. Um, uh, Four Sigmatic. Um, these are all brands that I still, uh, you know, if someone asked me, I'd say are incredible, great brands that we like. Um, but unfortunately, that's not the only thing that keeps us in partnership. Uh, we have contracts that we sign with people. And after a contract is over, we evaluate uh, how it went for them and how it went for us. And, some, and another thing that happens sometimes, uh, Mind Pump has now got to the place where we have a lot of volume, a lot of people. A lot of companies that we partner with are either startups or smaller businesses that are still growing. And not all of them have the, the resources and tools to retain um, as many members or leads as they need to justify the spend on the, on the podcast. So just because we, we, you know, quote unquote, break up with a partner, it doesn't necessarily mean there's, there's bad. In fact, it's rare that there's actually bad. Blood I don't think there's any that we have that we, we stopped working with that it was bad. There's never, I don't know if there's any been bad, but there's sometimes when we're like, eh, we don't want to do, we don't yeah, want to work yeah. with it anymore. It's not a product that we, we Maybe care enough about or there's a bet or, or there's better. Yeah. yeah. Right. Sometimes, um, Sometimes we we love a product, we find something, we're, we're working with them for a while, and uh, an even better brand comes along. It doesn't mean that we don't still think that first brand was not great and awesome still, but if we find a brand, and I'll, I'll use this example with something we're going through right now without saying names, is you know we find a brand that is uh, cheaper for our customer, uh, uh, more professional, faster, can handle more volume. Um, can can have have more resources. We may have opportunity for an equity play with it, and and it covers all the things that are matter to us as far as aligning with our our brand. Um, yeah, then it just how it's just business. It's not always. I mean, I think people on our forum and stuff mm -hmm. they they see uh, a, a, a strong like marriage. Uh, uh, they feel yeah, it's, a it's lot not of like things. someone cheated. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. and well, I get that. I mean, people do really honestly respect kind of like our opinion on a lot of products and things out there, and we present it that way, and that's you know all part of the process. Uh, but also, too, we're business owners, and you know, and, and they're business owners, and so maybe their ideas like of expansion are. are are elsewhere and you know that's happened before and you know we have ideas too that we could help kind of like promote things better and so it's just it's just a matter of like how it all like blends and works in the timing of it all yeah the, our um our commitment is not to our our partners that we do sponsorships with uh, our commitment is to our our fans our listeners uh the people who buy our products or listen to our advice that's number one so we can love a company. And first off, there's a vetting process when we first work with the company. And that is, A, is it a product that we use and that we like and that we trust? Is there third-party testing? Are they, do they have integrity? Then we meet the owners. Do we like them? Because they could have a great product, but if we don't like the owners, we're not going to work with them. Do we like the owners? Do we like their integrity? Do we like all that stuff? And then we end up working with them. So that means we like, we like them. But if it doesn't work great for our fans and listeners, or if it just doesn't align super well, then we may not work with them. And then sometimes it just doesn't work for the partner either. Like sometimes, like Adam said, sometimes they don't necessarily, they may count their returns uh, in ways where maybe we don't deliver necessarily because they don't necessarily see the, what we bring to the table. They may look at just numbers and say, well, we do better if we just advertise on Facebook or whatever. And we think that's a mistake, but that's totally their prerogative. But that's pretty much it. We yeah, really that, you have... just gave an example of the the breakup with Dr. Squatch. I mean, we were all really excited about that brand. Um, they are in super hyper growth mode and spending tons of money on advertising. And they purely look at just the do dollar ROI. So they spend X amount of dollars with Mind Pump. It should produce X amount of dollars to them. And they're comparing that against things like Facebook ads. And when you partner with a podcast brand, it's a slower, longer play. You're building a relationship with, with an audience. You believe in that that podcast and it's growing. And so together you're going to grow and you're going to cross pollinate and you're going to do right. launches and things together. And some brands really like that and appreciate that. And they and they they don't they're not so worried that oh we spent this much on ads and we only got this much return and I could we could technically go to these other 
other way, other mediums and make more money. Some of them see the value of like, for example, like brands that really love us and they don't make a lot of money off us. Seed's an example of that. Seed is a probiotic that is uh, a, a real, is in Sal's words, the, the best probiotic on the market. Um, they don't make a ton of money off of us. They could make it more of the ads, but they really need somebody to communicate uh, uh, that message and be able to explain the science as well as Sal does on the show. We have a few partners that they value our ability to communicate the product so well that the dollar doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Then we have other brands that the dollar is all that matters. Yeah. And and if we can't produce up to the amount that they want uh, for what they're spending, yeah. they they and, and we don't fault them for that either because it's a business. They have to scale. They mm-hmm. have to manage those things. And so many times it's it's an amicable split, and we we part ways, and we still tend to be friends on the on the on the yeah, uh, if outside. It would, if it, look, I'll say I'll tell you this much right now. This may be to our fault. If it's not amicable, and there was some shenanigans going on, you'll know because we have no problem saying <laughs> it. Just, we can make or break a company, and we have no problem breaking a company if they <laughs> if they do the wrong thing. But we have yet to have that happen. So yeah, that's nobody 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 does it's anything dirty. And it's just I know I know sometimes social media wants there to be more drama um it's but it's business and and sometimes we have to cut ties with even people that we like and brands that we really like because the businesses don't uh, align as well as they could and or there's another business out there that aligns even better than the one that we've been but i do i do take a lot of pride in the fact that we don't tend to hop a lot of brands i mean uh i i I think it's really I think it's gross when you see uh, fitness influencers hop from supplement pro- protein powder to protein powder to protein powder. Like I've seen some really popular, famous people that have had you know five, six protein powder brands that they've worked with uh, that they've dropped another one than another one, and yeah. it's like it's all the same. It's the, neither one of them are better than the other. It's just whoever's paying them at that time. And no, we've we've aligned with brands that we tend to stay with for a really uh, long period of time, and. Well, that's that's the, that's kudos to you, Adam, because uh, a lot of people don't know us. But Adam, uh, he really runs uh, the show on that, and he does a really good job of making sure that it's going to work out for everybody. That's why there's so few companies that we you know we we no longer work with. Usually, we do a pretty damn good job. Yeah, Bang, that's on you. So thank you. Good job. Look, if you like Mind Pump, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram at MindPumpAdam, and you can find me on Twitter, the freest social media site you can find, uh, at MindPumpSal. This one's really important, and that is to phase your training. If somebody trains for a full year doing a bench press, and they're always aiming for five reps, if you compared that person to a person who did bench press where they did three or four weeks of five reps, but then they did three or four weeks of 12 reps, and then three or four weeks of, let's say, 15 to 20 reps, and then they'll throw in some supersets, at the end of that year, you're going to see more consistent progress from the person who's moving in and out and less injury. That's another thing. You'll see less injury as well.